we start actually with the question uh, to you, how does the thesis resonate in your, uh, digital thesis resonate in your countries already? Uh, and uh, what is the state of awareness of uh, importance uh, to upgrade the FreeSys region uh, with this digital and cybersecurity dimension? Um, and uh, to which extent uh, is this kind of cooperation present, uh, is already present in the political agendas of your government? So uh, if I could start with Anushka, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, so first of all, before I start my intervention, I'd like to thank Isabella for inviting me um, for the cooperation on such an interesting project and, of course, on such a successful conference, both in terms of content as well as organization. Um, also, gratitude to Marta, who very painstakingly edited all of our content, which could not have been an easy task at all. Yes, Marta is present, uh, okay. present here, and yes, thank you very much, Marta. Thank you. <laughs> Think that together. Yes. So um, on uh, the awareness of the digital three Cs in this project, I'll make two brief points. Um, first of all, I think uh, the perception in Slovakia that is that there's a recognition that uh, the three Cs initiative is sort of a broader um, cooperation than the Michigan group. So the Michigan group, obviously, uh, the four countries: Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, and Slovakia. And there's been a lot of constructive cooperation um, on that front, and I think the recognition is that uh, Digital 3 just broadens that. On, on, because you have more actors, you have more nation states, but you also have a wider scope of issues. Um, and then on, on my second point is that in, in the five recognized issues within the 3 project, Slovakia, the Digital 3 project, Slovakia has, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, always emphasized cooperation, whether it's AI, whether it's security, whether it's 5G. Um, and I'll let the other panelists quickly speak because I think it's more important to go into the specifics and go into our recommendations um, in these main issues. Here, please. Thank you. Um, yes, first I would also like to uh, thank Kozielski Institute for inviting me and uh, congratulate for the uh, magnific magnificent event and conference. And um, coming to your question, then um, regarding the awareness uh, of uh, free uh, seas digital highway, I think uh, um, it could be um, higher in Estonia and the Baltic states. Uh, it's at the moment, uh, I think, um, policymakers are still focused on uh, Nordic region and uh, uh, there are lots of um, initiatives and political level declarations in terms of cooperating and becoming uh, test beds and uh, front runners in uh, developing artificial intelligence and uh, uh, 5G uh, just a week ago, Baltic uh, ministers uh, uh, signed the declaration on, on Via Baltica and 5G. So I think uh, in terms of um, cooperating among 12 countries, uh, there's still room for um, uh, raising awareness. And um, uh, in terms of the priority areas, I think uh, for Estonia, uh, 5G and AI are definitely uh, very um, high level um, issues and, and as, as you know we have uh, conducted already um, um, preliminary research on AI and the government will um, uh, also um, uh, draft the uh, policy concept this year. We'll come back to the artificial intelligence uh, for sure. I will take that opportunity to uh, also underline that uh, we will be very happy if uh, the International Center for Defense and Security join the consortium of uh, think tanks uh, uh, that uh, established the Digital Thesis Initiative. And so thank you for your input to the roadmap, uh, but I believe it is only the first step of the cooperation between our uh, institutions. Yeniko, please. Yes, I would also like to thank you and uh, it's really an honor for me to be here in Krakow on this cybersecurity conference. I think this is a very important topic and uh, 
it's um, it was for me a fantastic exercise, a mapping exercise to go through all these sectors from cyber security to 5G to digital industry to digital skills because uh, so far in Hungary I was not uh, having the possibility to read any reports which is so complex so I'm really looking forward uh, if I'm right in October, end of October we will be done with this paper it's also important to, to note that uh, the beginning of the paper is uh, collecting a variety of uh, data of the three seas uh, uh, countries so the 12 uh, different uh, member states and um, just to put this whole three C's into a little bit of a context, I think it's important to underline that um, uh, the European Union has a, has, a, has a fantastic ambitious plan that by 2025 the whole European Union is going to be a gigabyte society. However, it's also important to note that so far the European Union was uh, not putting enough uh, grants or money next to this uh, uh, very important plan. So if we, for example, compare that uh, for cyber security in the European budget that was 1.8 uh, billion euro and we compare that to the United States where it was 19 billion euro, it's a huge difference. We are looking forward that the new uh, budget is going to have a little bit uh, bigger, uh, so the next seven year budget is going to have a bigger um, uh, money for, for these innovations. I think it's very, very important. On the other side, it's really important to note that many, many times it's the responsibility of the government to put through all these, uh, all these investments. Mm -hmm. uh, concerning the, um, the, the Three Seas Initiative and Hungary, I think I agree with you because I think we also have to put a little bit more attention on the other hand, I would like to congratulate on my Romanian colleague because uh, the Bucharest summit was uh, very well done. Uh, I think uh, there was um, not only um, finalizing that there will be a three seas fund, but also the chambers of commerce uh, had the opportunity to sign finally a, an agreement that they will support startups, they will support innovation hubs. Also, Hungary is part of that, so we are very happy of that. And also, um, we are um, knowing the situation that uh, so far the North South corridor um, of interconnectivity uh, was lacking. So if there was not much attention put on that. And now we are really happy that finally these three season initiatives put more focus that the North South interconnectivity has to be done because this is this is basically the core of the future. Uh, uh, future uh, challenges and and, uh, and this is how we will be really successful all over in European Union. Absolutely agree and the same uh, I hope that uh, until Josef uh, Knowledge Center will become uh, the part of the consortium of think tanks and you are already <laughs> a great advocate uh, for that. Thank you. So thank you very much Isabel for having all of us here in this format and uh, for giving us the privilege and the opportunity to advocate for, uh, for this project. First of all, I would like to start with a reality check regarding the, this project. Following the Bucharest Summit and following the Bucharest uh, um, Summit uh, Business Forum and uh, uh, all the meetings there. So we have started to um, approach the stakeholders from the Romania and the policy makers and ask for their inputs and for their feedback regarding this, uh, this initiative. So the uh, first feedback, it is uh, very encouraging and welcoming and I uh, strongly believe that should empower us to move and advance our uh, work uh, forward. Uh, now, this is the good news. Now, um, we need to bear in mind that this project is, is quite connected, is, is very connected with the uh, TRISIS initiative, which uh, within the uh, Romanian public uh, space it is um, uh, very, uh, the awareness is very scarce regarding this initiative. So this is where I, uh, I strongly believe we should work more on. And um, I would uh, elaborate uh, uh, during the, the next question, so I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Julian, and I would like to thank you also for um, your input uh, to the uh, report, but also um, your support was uh, very important uh, in, in the Bukharest uh, 
the summit uh, because you were very close to what was going on there. Um, uh, I will start uh, with the question uh, regarding the priorities of the Digital Free uh, Initiative because uh, prioritization is a key of each successful project and due to uh, some limitations such as the financial resources, uh, existing know-how and uh, public awareness, uh, I think that we should uh, choose some goals and treat it as a priorities and uh, what priorities would you suggest for the start? I will make, we take the same order and ask Anushka to answer the question first. Is this working? Okay, great. Um, so I think talking about priorities, it will be, it is a difficult task given that we've already underlined five really important issues to focus on for each country, uh, for the region I mean. Um, in my opinion, however, uh, and taking into consideration the state of Slovakia, I think digital skills is probably where I would um, place my money. Uh, and there are a few reasons for this. So, first point would be that um, Slovakia, out of all the OECD countries, is actually the most susceptible uh, to automation. I think almost 33% of jobs uh, can be, uh, can be um, uh, automatized, uh, compared to I think it's 6% in Norway. Um, so this is a critical point. You know, a large section of, of the workforce in Slovakia would find itself basically um, uh, replaced by robots, which is, it, it, it sounds uh, cliche, but it's true. Um, second point would be that uh, last year actually I think was a very critical moment in Slovakia as far as cybersecurity is concerned because they released the cybersecurity legislation um, and in this legislation they completely emphasized the importance of rethinking the education sector and rethinking skills. Um, third would be that even in the, uh, we should have four priorities for artificial intelligence um, among other things like a pan-European initiative, again, what they're focusing mainly is the fact that we need to have a research institutions, we need to have universities, we need to have more um, students who are actually interested in, in STEM uh, research at an early age. I think that's the key difference. Um, and then finally, uh, and then the fourth point would be that uh, Slovakia, unfortunately, ranks the worst in terms of uh, women in ICT. I think that are, it's the lowest in the European Union. Um, that's definitely something, maybe I'm biased, but that's something I think needs to be a priority for, um, for the country. And then the fifth is, um, if, if, I have, if I can take a second, um, we, at the organization that I work for, called Globsec, we have something called uh, Globsec Trends 2018. And what we do is we take surveys from the four countries, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland. Um, and I'm just gonna throw this fact out there. So 53% of Slovaks think that secret groups control world affairs and aim to establish a totalitarian world order. Um, in the CEE region, only 27% um, believe that Russia had something, or Russia is trying to meddle with European elections. Um, and the last fact that I will throw at you is that the majority of social media users in all of these four countries that were surveyed um, don't actually report disinformation or don't report inappropriate content. So the reason why I mentioned this is because what it tells us that people are seeing certain false news online. It's affecting their perception. It's affecting their belief in conspiracy theories, but they're not doing much about it. So the final um, aspect of why I would uh, prioritize digital skills is that we need to increase awareness about this information. We need to increase awareness about false news uh, because it's genuinely affecting perceptions of, of the of the layman. Thank you very much. Good, please. In terms of uh, priority areas, I already mentioned uh, 5G and AI, but um, I would just say general comment that um, because um, it's a group of very diverse countries, each have um, um, their strengths and uh, weaknesses. So, um, but what maybe is um, common for everybody is that uh, we definitely need to develop uh, skills and uh, not only in terms of uh, the use of AI, but also uh, ICT and cyber uh, security, which, uh, and Estonia is uh, promoting this uh, 
throughout the, um, all uh, cycles of uh, national cybersecurity strategy and now we just released the third generation of the strategy and there is a strong emphasis on developing skills. Uh, but also, um, I think um, looking at what Estonia has done so far, then um, there is a need um, to enable um, development of new technologies and implementation by legislative framework, but not to um, regulate it uh, too much. Uh, so, uh, in this sense, uh, for example, 2017, uh, we enacted a law on uh, permitting um, the self-driving cars to drive on all roads. But from this also uh, comes the question that uh, what is the status of AI uh, in terms of human being and, and does it have a uh, liability or... or, or. So um, I think um, these areas are important, but because, and finally, <laughs> last but not least, the uh, cyber security and standards. Uh, because um, we are very much uh, connected to our neighbours um, in North and, and in South uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure, in telecom, in finance sector and uh, we are still not aware of what are the cross-border dependencies. So, uh, and, and this also um, comes to the idea of um, free flow of data and uh, data portability and enabling uh, uh, public key services, for example. And I think what we could do in this project is just to have those uh, bilateral and maybe trilateral sub-regional uh, best uh, practices and um, to include those. Um, with Finland we are developing now the secure uh, data exchange and the first, how it starts, is you have to define the problem you are going to solve. And the problem uh, with Finland is that uh, so many uh, workers from Estonia commute uh, to Finland, then we need um, uh, common um, health, not common healthcare system, but in order to, for example, have a e uh, or digital prescription in the drugstore in, in Finland, so we need to exchange uh, securely uh, information and also tax declarations and so on. So basically what I'm saying is that perhaps the best way is just to look at those functional areas which are important to individual countries and then, then start uh, with uh, small steps and, and uh, because it will be very difficult to have a overall framework for everybody. So. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to come back uh, to our economy as well as uh, Slovakia. Uh, it was a good uh, example. Hungary is another good example how we are actually depending on the automobile uh, industry. So far, what I can say, if you look at the digital ecosystem of Hungary, 27.5% uh, of dependency is on the automotive industry. Of course, uh, uh, for the Hungarian government, this is a priority not to depend so much on the automobile industry. So we would like to actually increase um, the, the healthcare section and the food industry section. Uh, there, we should do. Uh, we should put uh, provide um, more uh, labor skills, as was mentioned. However, we also have the same problem that we are missing the skills. We are missing the labor. And uh, besides Slovakia, Hungary is also one of those countries who lost uh, actually uh, quite a percentage of, um, of uh, young, talented people who decided to work more in Western Europe and left the country. So coming back um, to some of the priorities, I think this is a very complex uh, question. I always say that there is a matrix. Uh, it has horizontal and vertical issues. I think the Hungarian government uh, did a very, um, very good strategy, or they had a very good, um, good sense of, of touching uh, the complexity of this question. Uh, they started to run the digital well-being program in 2015, which has five priorities, and I think they are all connected. So let me uh, tell you these five priorities now. So the first is uh, to 
uh, enable digital access to the population, to the civilians. Second, that we should have a very well-worked digital network. Here comes the 5G and also other infrastructure um, uh, development, uh, development projects. Third is the digital knowledge. And here we are already talking about kindergartens because uh, in Hungary we are trying to set up the first smart kindergarten. Um, but there are mentoring points and other facilities which uh, will help uh, the knowledge transfer. The fourth point is to have a digital state. This comes, uh, here comes the smart city, the smart village program, the e-government program. And the fifth point is the digital economy. And here we can talk about the industry 4.0 and also all the sector questions like healthcare or agriculture, where all innovations are coming up and, and really um, putting um, a lot of SMEs uh, on the uh, platform of digitalization, where we really would like to be more competitive as our countries really depend on SMEs. So, uh, to answer your question, I would like to go back to our report first. So, uh, the general idea is that our report depicts the situation uh, in the Central and Eastern European cities with goods and bad. And definitely there are many opportunities. The general idea of our report is that in spite of the great potential the CE uh, has, uh, definitely the CE is lagging behind Western Europe. So this should be, in my opinion, the point where we should start uh, our uh, talks and observation. In the light of the uh, Romanian perspective, the two most important domains, and I would like to be very clear on this, uh, are cybersecurity and digital skills. What is the idea behind? First of all, we cannot talk about uh, secure and data, a secure and fast data transfer from north to, from north to south of the region if we, don't, we do not have cybersecurity. But I, I'm not referring uh, to cybersecurity only at the technical level, but, uh, but also at the policy level. So we need to deepen our cooperation in terms of our, uh, our policies related to cybersecurity. And also, uh, it has been stressed numerous times uh, during the Bucharest Summit, uh, we need to take into account the geopolitics of cybersecurity. For example, where do we buy the technology from? Okay, so uh, the second aspect it is related to the digital skills from, from um, our perspective and it is the uh, second most important domain. Uh, definitely we, uh, we have great potential and we should support and nurture talented people in our region and to keep our uh, talented people uh, within, within our countries. And second, we should uh, support those uh, digitally illiterate citizens to catch up uh, with, the, with the others. So, uh, for doing this, uh, we, need, uh, uh, we need not only policy consensus, but we need uh, to, invest, uh, to invest money, because this is digital skills, uh, I'm sorry, but are costly. We need to uh, est uh, establish uh, a sort of uh, common curricula in terms of the ICND, which is uh, not that easy. Uh, we need to do monitoring to uh, see which are the uh, learning outcomes and which are the di digital skills that are required for the, uh, for the future. And um, uh, last but not least, we need the commitment of our stakeholders, of our academia, and also of, uh, the commitment of the industry. We cannot do anything without the, the industry. Thanks. Yes, please. If I can just quickly jump in, just for a brief comment. Um, I think those two were extremely important uh, points to raise. Um, and I was particularly happy that the first point was mentioned, which is that it's not just about um, uh, uh, facilitating this kind of talent or facilitating people to move into STEM research and things like that. It's also about keeping talent um, within within the region. Uh, I think Slovakia as well as some other countries definitely uh, face the problem of brain drain because there are so many better uh, or uh, it's perceived that there are better opportunities um, in other countries. So that's uh, equally important. Um, definitely, and I think that we can cooperate uh, in that um, exchanging uh, students and building uh, curricula that are very relevant to the dynamic.
aspects of uh, digital um, transformation, digital uh, progress. Um, uh, I think that uh, another question will be related with artificial intelligence because most of you, uh, of you underline that uh, this is the emerging uh, technology. And you stated in the report that currently AI is uh, growing in importance in the ICT uh, sector in your uh, countries. Uh, nevertheless, we can see already uh, by uh, comparison that there are uh, differences uh, in here in implementing the technology and uh, in putting, uh, in coming up with the strategy uh, for uh, its development. Uh, so to succeed uh, within the three Cs, uh, we need to uh, have a coherent approach, uh, I guess, to uh, AI, um, both internally and uh, externally, uh, so how we can enhance the capabilities in uh, the three Cs uh, in that uh, respect. Um, and given the existing AI initiatives in your country, which of them could, could be implemented in the region in your opinion? So maybe I will start with Anush Kajen. Thank you. So uh, with respect to AI, on, on the business side, on the private sector side in Slovakia, there are um, a growing number of technological startups, um, including those that specialize in creating AI tools for business. Um, and, and we also have a fair share of international market players. We have Case Grant, we have ESET, um, who are working in this heavily and investing in this heavily. Um, as far as the government is concerned, um, actually the Slovak government very recently, two months ago, has uh, prioritized three specific stakeholders to foster capacity building. So the first are universities and research organizations. Second are businesses that transfer expertise from labs to market. And then finally are public administrators that should follow best practices um, in decision making. So, I, and uh, as I mentioned before, there was the Visegrad 4 AI paper, which um, one of the recommendations was a pan European initiative on um, uh, for opening up uh, research development in the field of AI, as well as implementing ethically based AI systems. Um, I don't think we have enough time to sort of go into the nuances of AI and ethics. Um, that's, a, that's a whole other debate. However, on that front, I do think I want to mention that some of the uh, questions that we face while devising AI policies, they will probably and exponentially change in the next five years. I mean, if we take into account the rapid technological development, especially in the field of AI, we also have to keep this in mind, that the, the questions that we're, being, that we're dealing with now are not going to be the same questions that we'll probably deal with five to 10 years later. Um, and as far as coherent approaches are concerned, that would be a consideration um, that the region should adopt. Okay, yeah, please. Regarding Estonia, um, as I mentioned, then uh, we are just in the beginning and uh, the government is uh, developing the uh, concept uh, during this year. But uh, I think it's a uh, very high level at uh, political agenda because um, the Prime Minister is heading advisory council of uh, EU state and uh, there are uh, several visionaries in new technologies and they are discussing uh, those issues in, in many formats and uh, also because you can see that the thinking is going um, this way um, um, they have already came up with the legislation and so on um, but in terms of um, research and development I think uh, that um, uh, it's, it's more the Estonian um, strengths are in the area of crypto and, and also uh, a secure uh, digital identification. And, and uh, so these are the, our, uh, I would say, potential areas. Um, I'm, I don't know really uh, if there are any best practices from the AI side. <laughs> Hungary is the same. We still don't have a strategy. Um, supposedly it's coming out this year, maybe only next year, but it's on the agenda. Uh, so far the artificially intelligent and robotics programs were co-financed by the European Union. We also, as it 
was mentioned, we also joined the EU initiative on artificial intelligence just this April, uh, which was initiated by the European Commission. Hungary also joined the Horizon 2020 artificial intelligence for EU uh, group. Uh, what uh, our specialty is, uh, I think we have uh, three major areas where we could say that we are outstanding. Uh, one is um, brain research. Uh, for example, in 2018 spring was the first brain uh, surgery done by only robotics. So I think here we can do more. Uh, we do some excellent research and uh, I can say it's also outstanding uh, in um, quantum technology and agriculture innovation. So, uh, as a small country, I think here comes again that uh, we should share best practices, as it was mentioned by you as well. And uh, of course, as a small country, we can only be uh, very good at one specific uh, section or sector, not more than that. And, um, and um, coming back to the, the basic questions, yes, artificial intelligence is getting more and more important, and uh, the whole uh, Europe is, is facing that. So, for example, there will be a great project worthwhile to follow is that Hungary is going to open up um, next, uh, in five, six years, sorry, in five, six, six years, the first smart hospital where only robotics will jump around and give medic medical uh, medicines to the patients and then all the high tech is going to be built into one super hospital. So we are looking for that project. So I'd like to uh, present uh, our perspective and also my perspective uh, as I spent a short period of time within the Artificial Intelligence Research Institute of the Romanian Academy. And the basic idea behind it, what I'd like to, to emphasize here, is how we have uh, Romania, we, uh, how we have failed to, uh, uh, to grasp the, the artificial intelligence and to take benefit of it. Despite the fact that we have uh, a tradition of more than 40 years within the artificial intelligence research. Uh, right now, we are still uh, very, uh, we, are still, we are lagging behind the, the rest of the region and um, uh, the Western Europe. So, the main point uh, where I believe we have failed um, are three. First of all, uh, we have failed to get the commitment of the stakeholders and uh, the commitments of the policymakers to adopt a legal free framework to, uh, to prepare our society for the advent of the AI. And second, when it is about our citizens and our society, we should bear in mind that uh, artificial intelligence is no, is no milk and honey. So, uh, of course, there will be job losses. There, there will be uh, maybe uh, at some point um, uh, sort of um, upheavals in the thinking of the population re uh, regarding the, the AI. And um, the third point where we have uh, also failed is that we uh, didn't uh, map which are the most important sectors of the uh, Romanian economy, where do we need the artificial intelligence? So, uh, having three failures in a row, it was a total failure, but I strongly believe that we can uh, uh, learn from the others, uh, we can share uh, our best lessons, we can cooperate, we can develop common policies within the region, and uh, last but not least, the two leapfrog in the field of AI. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, I will now uh, like to ask you about the free flow of data because uh, you mentioned that uh, our countries are relatively uh, small, uh, especially when we compare ourselves to China or the US. And uh, um, data is a very important factor to build artificial intelligence. Uh, so where you are uh, in your countries when it comes to the enhancement of the mm, free flow of data, and uh, basically what might be the best practices in that respect, how we can cooperate in the 3 c region. Great, um, thank you. So, I think um, in, in Slovakia, I'll 
go back to the first point that I made, which is that priority in, in the five recognized sectors that um, we presented in the report, free flow of data kind of is almost indispensable to all of them. Um, especially because, like it was mentioned, we're small countries. Um, and from, from Slovakia's perspective, I think it would really, really benefit to maybe uh, not only um, do something a little more as far as policy is concerned, but work closely with the neighbors. That I, I'm not sure that that's happened as much as it needs to happen from um, the government perspective in Slovakia. But that would just be my brief point. Um, in terms of uh, free flow of data, um, I think um, there's also a question of uh, interoperability of the digital infrastructure in different countries. Uh, because I remember when our um, ministers a couple of years ago tried to uh, digitally sign an agreement with Latvia, it took several months until it was actually realized. But uh, as I mentioned, the X-Road um, enhancement project with Finland and uh, also Estonia has uh, developed this uh, novel concept of data embassies. So we have uh, opened up in Luxembourg and there will be other countries uh, the highly secure um, databases. So I think um, thinking on, on, on these terms, uh, then uh, there are again <laughs> some best practices, but uh, it's important uh, that um, whatever um, data is exchanged, then it's done securely. <laughs> so this is the security by, by design, privacy by design, which has been a very key principle from the very start of developing Estonian digital infrastructure. Um, what I can add to this uh, is that I think uh, for all of our country, GDPR, was a basic regulation. We are really happy that finally we have that. Um, I would also like to mention that um, that's one thing that we would like to have, uh, the free flow of data. And uh, as, as it was mentioned uh, today and yesterday, that the European Union wants to have this single space for data. But I think it's also very important that um, uh, we try to secure it, but on the other hand, it's also important to, to, to have an effective controlling system. So who controls that these data are not uh, stolen or not um, used for, for, um, for bad um, situations? So I think it's also important that each and every country has um, uh, an ombudsman, for example, a strong um, a strong uh, advisory team who are always checking and, and monitoring the situation. Also, I think our courts have to be uh, ready if uh, cases are coming up to actually give um, uh, well-based um, decisions on that. And it's really important to see that in the global context, if we look, for example, the European, uh, the United States or China, there is like no protections at all of data. So uh, it's also important to, to save the European data for the Europeans. That's, uh, I think, we really have to think about it in the future. Well, as much has been said uh, about the free flow of non personal data, um, we are, uh, uh, we are still pioneering uh, this, this domain and for sure we are uh, looking to, to share uh, uh, with you uh, and uh, to get from you your best practices to, to catch up uh, you in this domain. Uh, as the uh, general situation uh, uh, regarding the free flow of non-personal data uh, looks poor right now, we, we didn't establish the, the framework for this and uh, for this, and uh, right now we are, uh, as I said, we are pioneering it. So we are looking forward to cooperate with other countries and to learn from uh, other countries mostly. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, and I think that it will be uh, the last question. A uh, very uh, up-to-date uh, subject relates to upcoming um, elections uh, in the region. Uh, how to enhance our social social 
resilience uh, towards disinformation because we share the same threat. Uh, how to cooperate in that respect uh, within the region, with the European Union and maybe uh, with partners uh, such as the US, for example? Thank you. Um, so, if everyone remembers the facts, lots of facts that I said uh, in the beginning, um, you know, it's, like I said, disinformation um, generally changes the perceptions of a lot of uh, people, not just uh, in the in CE, but um, around the world. And it's interesting because I think from the report, there were 68% of young Slovaks who actually encountered it, and a very small majority, a small minority actually did something about it because they didn't know what to do. So they knew that that was false information, but they, it's, there was no feedback loop. They, 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 they didn't know who to go to in order to report that um, event, which is uh, quite a shame. So at, a, at its most basic, um, and this I'm talking about social resilience, I'll come to the, what the government has done later, but at its most basic, uh, I think we really need to increase just basic awareness um, about what false news can be, how false news can look like. It's a very dynamic um, uh, space, if I can put it like that. Um, so first, social resilience, I think we need to increase awareness about what false news is. Um, and I know that there are businesses are doing a lot of work on this, especially coming up with um, certain tools that can allow you to differentiate between the two. But it's not just about technological tools that you give to someone, because then we're going back to the same thing where, where you're just throwing technology onto people. I think it starts with the basic understanding that this does exist, because you'd be surprised that a lot of people actually don't even know that what they're reading is false. Um, uh, as far as uh, Slovakia's government um, is concerned, so strategic communications and shortfalls in strategic communications was recognized, I think, in the defense paper in 2016. Um, and then the Slovak Information Service actually set up the National Security and Analytical Center uh, in 2013, and this is what uh, one of their areas is combating um, disinformation online and hybrid threats. Um, as far as what can be done, you know, Overall, I think it needs to be, the question is, what kind of problem we're trying to solve? Because your response will be dependent on that. So if you're trying to solve the problem of, well, there's no, there's no awareness, people can't differentiate, that's where you begin. If you're trying to solve uh, the problem of the rapid flow of, of misinformation, then we need to then have some technical um, support on how to, how to counter that. So I think in this, it's, it's too vast. Um, an issue, it's too, there are too many moving parts to this issue to just have one solution. Again, it's important that you define the problem that you're trying to solve. And that's probably where I start. Um, regarding disinformation and propaganda, I, I'm not sure that this is the problem of uh, free seas, it's a broader problem. Uh, so maybe tackling it in this uh, cooperation framework is, is uh, not justified in this sense, but um, because there is lots of uh, cooperation within the EU and in NATO, uh, maybe not in NATO so much uh, precisely on disinformation, but uh, regarding st uh, common strategic com uh, communication with, between NATO and the EU, and also in Charlie there's a NATO Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, in Helsinki, there's uh, European Hybrid Threats uh, Center of Excellence in Liga. Uh, there's a Stratcom uh, Center of Excellence. So uh, it's, it's very um, well um, covered, I think, our, our region in this uh, respect. But um, I was just thinking that um, we can say that the disinformation highway is in Estonia, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, um, safeguarded by just the um, size of the Estonians uh, who are um, uh, immune to Russian propaganda in the sense that uh, they just don't understand it and it's very difficult. If I'm talking about the younger generation, it's very difficult to um, um, disseminate uh, this propaganda in Estonian language. So, but of course, uh, um, um, we, we are vulnerable as the other countries uh, uh, because we have uh, many Russian speakers as well. And, uh, and uh, I think um, uh, sharing best practices, uh, cooperation between uh, 
specific policy advocacy think tanks and, and government uh, cells and, and offices and, and just uh, grassroots level is very important but uh, I'm personally I'm not uh, sure that this relates to the uh, economic uh, cooperation and new, new technology. Of course yes if you're talking about how the uh, machine learning and so on uh, amplifies the messages and, and uh, actually enhances uh, the ways to do harm. Yes, in, in this area, I think uh, there is a room for cooperation. Uh, concerning Hungary, I think, um, I wish we, we would talk more about uh, disinformation. Uh, I also think that um, um, we have to do that on our think tank level, and I'm really happy uh, um, in March, it will be on our agenda, for example, that the Antigosheth Knowledge Center is going to organize a, a big uh, international conference in Brussels uh, entitled Hacking Democracy. I think it's really, really important to talk about it. Um, it would be also very important to raise awareness that um, people should read uh, news in different languages, although it's in Hungary still uh, sometimes a problem that people only read Hungarian agencies. Um, but what I really uh, would like to, to say as a point which we could actually maybe elaborate on, that I really liked um, that uh, last week um, uh, Theresa May and the Dutch Prime Minister Ruta came out and, and had a joint statement where they um, condemned what's happening um, um, from the Russian side that uh, Russia is always trying to um, attack or, or international system or, or open um, flow of information. And I think such joint statements, and before there was a Tusk, Juncker, and Mogherini had a joint statement. So I think these statements are very important. And if we see that uh, presidents or, or, or leaders of a country, they come together and together they make joint statements, and raise bigger awareness that this is what's happening, I think that could be a role model also for our region. As our time is almost almost ran out, I'll go on fast forward and I'd like to share uh, with you um, or, or best practice, let's say. Uh, and my memory regarding uh, uh, information warfare is very fresh, because uh, two days ago we, uh, hold, we had a referendum uh, on a very emotional national uh, subject in Romania. And um, long story short, the basic idea is that we, we have uh, added information warfare as, as a strategic challenge and threat within our national defense strategy. And uh, for that reason, we tackle uh, uh, information warfare on a few specific domains. We tackle information warfare on infrastructure. The more, uh, the more resilient is the infrastructure, the less uh, the short are the effects. We also uh, focus on public diplomacy and awareness uh, and on the security culture uh, of the Romanian city, citizens. And the last but not the least on the public services. The more integrated they are, the less prone they are to information warfare and the effects of the information warfare in the context of the uh, cyber attacks and so on. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Uh, so we shared uh, common threads, uh, we came up with uh, common solutions uh, and I'm looking forward for our common uh, roadmap that will be presented to our governments and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see its uh, implementation of uh, the recommendations uh, of uh, think tanks. Uh, thank you very much and uh, um, now uh, we will uh, start the second part uh, of the panel. So please uh, stay with us, there is no break. So thank you very much. Okay, well thank you uh, very much for uh, joining us for this uh, session uh, late on the second day. Um, I'm Tom Reeve, uh, Deputy Editor at SC Magazine UK, as, uh, as I said. Um, I'd just like to start by saying, uh, last time I was here was uh, two years ago. Um, and I must say, it's, it's very nice to see uh, how CyberSec has uh, grown and developed uh, in that time. So thank you uh, very much.
for having me here again. Now, I'd just um, like to turn to our uh, panel, um, and following on from the uh, discussion we, uh, that we just had, um, obviously this, this region is growing in uh, importance, uh, attracting a lot more attention from um, countries such as uh, my own uh, Great Britain, the US, China, and, uh, and of course Russia. Integration and development of uh, fiber optics and uh, 5G networks will play a key role, as we've been hearing, in future development uh, of the region. But geopolitical importance in history as a uh, test bed for advanced cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns means this will make an attractive target and uh, cyber security will be vital to its success. So um, I'd like very much to just concentrate on the, uh, the theme of uh, cyber security and um, make, you know, look at ways to avoid uh, the, the Digital Three Cs initiative uh, being leveraged to uh, promote yet more attacks uh, on uh, countries in this region. So I'd like to um, turn, first of all, uh, to the Minister. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs has been very supportive of the Digital Three Cs uh, initiative um, and uh, has funded the production of the uh, forthcoming report uh, and also this discussion here today and uh, I know the parties involved are grateful for that. So, uh, Minister, uh, how should a future cooperation on the development of the digital element of 3Cs uh, be framed? And, um, and what can the Ministry do uh, to support this? Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me and uh, give me the chance to thank the, the organizers, thank to thank the, the contributors. After the, the panel, I, I can only uh, repeat what Lord Robertson used to say, that everything has been said but not by everyone. Um, great report. Uh, congratulations to, Kos to Kosciuszko's Institute. Uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs is happy that uh, to, to, to support it and to, to become part of the, of the conference and of the report, we are definitely committed to continue our cooperation with uh, both non-government um, entities uh, and government um, entities on promoting digital dimension of the CIS initiative and, um, and developing it. Uh, from our point of view, there are two most important features, security and prosperity. Uh, the, uh, the fiber optic um, infrastructure, the 5G uh, technology uh, should be developed in a way that would make the eastern flank of NATO uh, more secure. From the very beginning, we need to think about security of the, both of the infrastructure and the technology, hardware and software. Uh, and secondly, prosperity. Uh, we need, we, when designing and when, when uh, developing it, we need to understand this will increase, this will attract foreign investments and will open new markets, will open new, um, uh, new production centers uh, in the region. The whole, and, and, and in, a, in this way it fits very well the, the very original idea of, of the Three Cs uh, initiative, which is not to counter, not to challenge the other centers of prosperity, um, the other markets, but to catch up with with EU15 and to make EU27 soon, unfortunately, uh, more competitive uh, globally. Uh, the, the, as, as the previous panel um, concluded, the north-south connections somehow lagged behind the, the east-west. We are now, we are now uh, focusing on, on those. And obviously, from the, for the very technical reason, the digital, uh, uh, the digital connections have to be developed parallelly to uh, transportation uh, or energy, 
this, this, is, um, this is stating the obvious, but uh, in, in, uh, in this government uh, where we have, uh, and, and those ministries uh, were represented during the conference, I'm very happy about it, the Ministry of Digital, the Ministry of Entrepreneurship and Technology, and the Ministry of Defense will be responsible uh, for, for making sure that we, uh, we work on those uh, connections um, highways, 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 digital highways, <laughs> energy highways, if I may say so, um, uh, together. Uh, we see, we are now witnessing very different, very, very uh, challenging, at least this initiative idea project, the North Stream, and we see that digital is developed, it may, may be in some respects are equally important to the, to the energy part of, uh, of it. In, uh, we uh, we need to take care that, that we are also um, digital or northeast uh, uh, connections and uh, this and what the MFA is um, um, very uh, pays pays attention to is is how to use both EU funds uh, to to encourage the developments to to, to progress uh, private uh, investments non-European um, uh, instruments um, the, because we see not only uh, high interest from, from the US to a three season initiative generally but also to digital but we also see uh, interest from China we see uh, interest from Asian um, powers, economic powers mm, Germany recently um, submitted uh, or, or declared interest in, in becoming a member of this is initiative, so we would like to uh, attract and, and to use uh, uh, use uh, this uh, this attention, this interest in this is initiative to the benefit of, of, of the region and, and the EU um, general. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I'd like to um, we have two journalists on the uh, panel with us, uh, so uh, I'd like to turn to them. They are. Uh, uh, subject experts in, in various areas. Um, I'd like to start with Carolina, Can, uh, if I could. So the, the, the region um, sees itself as a uh, test bed, really, for cyber attacks um, by certain nation states. And, and how do you feel that the Digital Three Seas Initiative um, can, can help with that uh, in terms of combating that kind of threat? Okay, uh, hello. Uh, it's uh, also for me an honor uh, to be able to speak here and uh, to be here uh, with you. Yes, indeed, uh, Central and Eastern Europe countries see themselves as a kind of a playground uh, for foreign powers. So, from the one hand, it's the European Union that we belong to and want to cooperate together, but on the other hand, there is Russia, who actually, as its forefront playground, treats Ukraine, but there is more and more present China. China, uh, against which uh, just recently Donald Trump um, accused other nation uh, against and uh, accused China for inter uh, meddling into the political um, political views of uh, American citizens be, be before in front of the incoming midterm elections and uh, in view of the future presidential elections. And China is also having its Ukraine uh, of tests of uh, cyber uh, cyber operations, which are the, the, the areas that it treats as internal. Uh, so it's Taiwan, uh, for example, it's uh, Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, definitely what uh, our uh, region can do to not to avoid being this playing ground, but also to ensure investment, but also to uh, to receive more respect in, in leveraging the discussion about uh, cyber, uh, cyber security and resilience to it. It's 
does really making this cooperation work, making it work uh, via achieving a real tangibility of it by setting its own budget, so maybe for securing the eastern flank of NATO is a longer term perspective, but now we need to get down to mundane everyday work, so also setting up, up people in the countries uh, of, of the initiative at ministries to really cooperate uh, together to set up the regulatory framework. What is really important is to persuade the European Union that it's not another centrifugal uh, um, uh, initiative that works against the old European Union countries, but it is uh, very compatible with it and within the European Union framework. And also, probably what would be really uh, effective for the initiative to be uh, competitive, more competitive, is also become making it a part of European Union umbrella. So, so in the end, uh, th these investments and these uh, actions can really make uh, this region safe for investment in the future. Um, and ensure it so and also the resilience in terms of social and of infrastructural safety will uh, come along together. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Um, we turn to um, Laurence, who's um, for Politico, um, keeps an eye on what's happening in Brussels. Um, and uh, so I'd like to ask, what sort of uh, discussions are taking place in Brussels around investment um, in this region, um, and, and, and also in cyber security in general? And what are the, the international implications um, of this for the region, but also for Europe as a whole? Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll maybe slightly build on what Carolina has said uh, as well, uh, but indeed, so um, <clears throat> I think for me, look, working from Brussels, looking at, at the Digital 3Cs initiative, um, what's, what's interesting is that it, it fits within um, a, a trend that we've seen in, in the European Union uh, in the past year, year and a half, two years or so, uh, where um, I believe that the strategic thinking uh, within the Commission and within the EU institutions has slightly changed. And what's interesting uh, is that this year with the Bucharest uh, uh, meeting uh, of, of additional three Cs uh, countries, uh, that the discussion shifted um, to the digital space, uh, to networks, to data flows, uh, to the infrastructure, and at the same time it brings it into sort of geopolitical uh, discussion. Um, and that link is uh, something I think is relatively new among uh, sort of uh, among people thinking about technology in Europe. Uh, and I think uh, the Digital Free Seas Initiative is an interesting test case also for Brussels policymakers to look at um, and to see how, how, how policymakers in, in, in Eastern Europe uh, deal with it. Um, a couple of points that I, that I, that I might um, uh, point to is um, um, if we're talking about investment, um, there's been a lot of talk about, about um, integrating this into EU investment schemes. Um, uh, what's interesting is that on the investment, this, the region really is sort of a, a battleground state, I think. Um, uh, there's interest very much from European partners, and there's also interest from China. Is, and I read in, 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 in the documentation about the initiative that there's a strong transatlantic uh, philosophy behind it. And so to a certain extent, the question on investment is a strategic question uh, that the region is asking itself. Uh, and with it, Europe as a whole, I think, is, is asking itself, where do we, where do we, um, where do we, which, which risk assessment do we make in accepting investment from outside of Europe? In an ideal world, Europe would be the richest uh, region in the world. Um, every single European country would, uh, would be uh, among the richest countries in the world. Uh, but there is an economic reality in Europe as well, um, which 
demands you the policy makers to also look outside of Europe for investment, I think. Uh, what's been interesting is that, uh, interesting is that China is, is, is very, very proactive in this discussion uh, with its uh, strategies. Um, and of course, the trade relationship with the US right now is, a, is, is, is one that's sort of very much in motion. Uh, so the, the, the choices that Europe makes this year, uh, next year, uh, on, on, on the issues of investment um, are really going to define a lot of what sort of digital sovereignty and geopolitics and technology looks like uh, in, in, in the years to come. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I think there's other points that we can discuss later on. There's a lot that Brussels can learn from, from Eastern Europe in general uh, as well, uh, on cybersecurity, but we might keep those for later. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Laurence. Um, and of course, we, uh, we have uh, Piotr uh, with us here today. Um, and I wanted to, to ask from a, from a business point of view, um, I mean, we talk about government action, government policies, but obviously much of what we're talking about has to be implemented by, um, by the private sector. Um, but those interests don't always, I suppose, don't always align up. Um, so how can, we, how can we deal with that uh, issue whilst also allowing the private sector to get involved in contributing to uh, the cyber security of the region? Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for having me here. And also having the opportunity to be the partner of this uh, conference for the fourth consecutive year. Uh, I am representing a business community uh, around the Vietnam. I have also a other uh, small little hat as a member of Microsoft family. Um, and in terms of uh, uh, cooperation between, uh, between governments and between businesses, I think uh, FRISI's initiative and this digital element that has been, that, that is being created right now, this is actually a good opportunity for us to once again show that uh, we should be, as a, as a business community, taken into account um, when uh, when thinking about building um, a new, let's say, cooperation platforms, uh, starting uh, in, the, in the political area through policy area, and then uh, at the end or as the next element, simply building the the fabric for economy and society. The business community would like to be a part of it. That's a sort of simplest answer. And uh, in terms of in terms of IT industry as a whole, uh, my my kind of conclusion looking at the last t ten years of, of technological development, on one hand we see that technology is being more and more regulated, is almost treated as one of the so-called regulated industries, along tobacco, pharma, oil, uh, energy, um, and. The more, the more technology is being regulated, I think the, the next step is that technology is being taken into account when we talk about geopolitics. Uh, why? Because with, with technology we can deliver certain value to the society and to the economy, but more and more with technology we see threats that are coming to society, to economy, and to geopolitics. Technology is becoming one of the tools um, used by, by those who want to sort of destabilize. Yes, five years ago, uh, technological developments were uh, claimed to be the, the uh, really supportive tool to build democracy. Five years later, technology tools are actually claimed to be very destructive towards uh, democracies. So, uh, the business community and IT community has to somehow embrace this and understand it and, and take also part of the responsibility how to manage that. And then digital, uh, uh, digital free seas is yet another platform where we can say, okay, let's, uh, let's create as much value for this region as possible uh, and, and then think what are the areas where this value can be created uh, with the help of, of, of technology and technology industry, but also rec let's recognize the threats that are particularly in this region that are strictly connected to technology. And cyber area is, is one of them. Uh, I'm not going to repeat um, the, uh, the statements about um, uh, sort of uh, testbed and, and 
forefront, I would say, between two, two powers. Um, I, I really like the, the, the focus, focus areas that were presented by, by previous panelists um, around digital skills, around AI, and around cybersecurity. Uh, I think digital skills is uh, sort of connected with, with all, of, all of the others. Yes, we, we need to think about digital skills in this region when we talk about AI and the future of AI. We need to think about digital skills when we are talking about cybersecurity and, and uh, raising the resilience. Because if we don't, if we do not have experts, well, we will, uh, uh, we cannot do anything good about it. Uh, so, in, in uh, as a representative of the business community, I think we can really help in all of those three areas. Uh, talking about digital skills and what kind of skills for the future are needed, uh, particularly in this region. Talking about cybersecurity, I think the main stress should be put into um, a higher degree of cooperation uh, between those countries and exchange of the information, exchange of the expertise. When we were in the European Union discussing about NIST directive, this element was actually one of the elements where there were some differences between uh, sort of well-established uh, and bigger countries who have the expertise for a number of years and the smaller ones that this links and, and exchanges are, uh, is actually not, not working well. I think within, within FISI's uh, initiative and its digital chapter, this cooperation should be really brought up to a higher level. Thank you. Thank you. That leads quite nicely to my next question, actually, which is uh, for the uh, for the minister. Um, as we heard in the previous um, panel, um, so some of the countries in the region are still working to develop their cyber security strategies, um, and uh, obviously things like the NIST directive, NIST directive helped to provide a, um, a framework for that. But uh, to, to what extent? You know, can the the country the countries in the um, the uh, three C's um, initiative um, cooperate on so, uh, cyber security if they don't have their own sort of cyber security uh, policies and frameworks um, set out? And, and can the three C's initiative help them to develop this? Three C's initiative doesn't hurt, but we shouldn't forget that uh, the countries are members of NATO and the EU, and these are the platforms of uh, cooperation uh, on cybersecurity. Uh, cooperation is critical because it's obvious that an enemy would hit the weakest ring of the chain first. And if we have, uh, we are all NATO members, but some of us are uh, the, are much weaker on securing its networks that are then linked to NATO or EU networks. So the so an enemy sneaks into uh, can 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 be a threat to Poland through non-Polish um, systems. And um, we had a case um, maybe one of the most. Uh, spectacular cases when head of the Portuguese intelligence for several years was uh, uh, was the, was uh, selling information to to an enemy. Uh, so uh, Portugal is not three C's initiative country, obviously, but this can happen everywhere. So 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 the 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 three C but the, what three C's initiative is about is that we can help to equal. The, the level of security on the eastern flank. And we can equal the level of attractiveness when we talk about the prosperity uh, angle, but th these are security and prosperity very much uh, linked to each other and interconnected. Um, so uh, that's the idea, to, to, to make those who are weaker for, for reasons, uh, for different reasons. Um, but maybe, but maybe very skillful on on a on a niche uh, things, and then it's not it's not it's not like that country X country is weak on all cyber things. It's, these are there, there is number of 
of, um, of niches and, and uh, every country has, uh, has a um, leading role on some of them and, and, they, and they, should, they should work together but I don't see the Thrisis initiative which is a very, I would say, the, it's not institutional. It doesn't have a secretariat, it doesn't have a uh, you know, chancellery where documents, data could be aggregated. Uh, this, is, uh, this is NATO, this is EU, these are different, uh, different parts of governments, like MODs have their platforms. Uh, yesterday, today in Lyon, uh, meet uh, ministries of interior of G6 group. We have uh, intelligence services, have their own group, which con consists of different number of, of countries. So, so uh, we don't lack in platforms. Um, this is initiative will be rather encouraging, but not the main platform in this regard. Right, okay, so it's an interesting point about uh, it helping to equalize the uh, levels of security between different countries. Uh, I think, Laurence, did, did you want to respond to that? I wanted to play devil's advocate uh, as to what you were saying. I think I, I think the, 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 if we're talking about NIS direct and cybersecurity and sharing of information, that is the big question, right? And I think <clears throat> the point that you mentioned that every single uh, country part of the Free Seas Initiative is a member of EU and is a member of NATO, um, that's true, and those organizations do have institutional cap capabilities, but it, it's not really working extremely well there either if we're talking about sort of the hardcore cyber security uh, issues that Europe is facing. I think to a certain extent you're seeing um, the international cooperation on cyber security becoming more fragmented uh, and uh, last year we've seen the UN level sort of coming to a standstill, uh, the UNGGE um, didn't manage to make any progress and now the question is, okay, uh, which other platforms, which other groups uh, can we see taking steps forward? Um, I think it would be interesting to see digital uh, VCs, uh, countries taking big steps forward on cybersecurity. But I think we should be uh, somewhat uh, cautious in, uh, in the promise that it, that it has uh, when it comes to sharing information and sharing sort of the hardcore intelligence uh, that is needed. I think also what, what we've seen in the past week is that um, with, with the case of the, the Dutch, the British, the US, and then other uh, intelligence services and governments speaking out about attribution, this is something that goes along by bilateral and sort of smaller groups of countries. Um, and I think it shows the limits of, of, of platforms like the EU and NATO. Um, so I would be cautious of that fact before we sort of talk up the, 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 the promise of uh, of, of, of any platform. Every platform has its role, but it's, it's a fragmented space. So I just wanted to add that, uh, to, to my last point also, that if you don't want to have a Trojan horse uh, um, on our doorstep uh, in this ge geostrategic, ge geopolitical play uh, between the powers, uh, like China again and uh, Russia, I think we need to integrate this policy also with Western Balkans uh, because um, the Central and Eastern European countries that belong to the European Union usually, uh, usually still stick to cooperation within the European Union. However, the six Western Balkan states, they are really at the crossroads. They're really having uh, China, Russia, but also Turkey, but also Saudi Arabia fighting for investments there. And uh, it can really, in, for example, Serbia is more and more assertive towards European Union, saying we, have, we are a free country, we can cooperate with China. So I think it's really important to take Western Balkans uh, into account when setting up any Central Eastern European initiatives that, will, that we want to be meaningful. I would, I would put the same question to um, Belgium too, uh, in terms of you know, to what extent can we, can we use the, will the region be able to use the 3Cs initiative to, to level up the, the, the countries? 
uh, approach to cybersecurity. And I suppose maybe you can add it to the business perspective too in terms of how can you help with this? I already mentioned that actually in the, in the, in the area of cybersecurity, I see actually quite a big potential uh, of, of, of the cooperation. Um, I can say that uh, looking historically, let's say 2007 and uh, first uh, quite massive attack uh, from the East uh, to Estonia, uh, this was kind of one of the first lessons that those countries in the uh, north south belt uh, and the border of the European Union witnessed and, and, and took the learning from. Um, and, and, and I think co collective, let's say, or the, the, the group cooperation in this regard uh, could actually uh, really help and make a change. Uh, and also in connection with the cooperation uh, with the business. In, in Central Eastern Europe, we have um, economies that are predominantly run by small and medium business. This is usually 90% of, of GDP which is being brought by SMEs. But at the same time, we have also all the biggest global players. And uh, probably, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say something wrong, but all of those global players have similar kind of mission, that they are globally present, but they want to be locally relevant. And, and uh, their job, daily job, is to really bring the, 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 the global value that they have uh, to the local economy and, and, and then support building this local economy uh, through uh, the, the operation of small and medium businesses. Uh, that those small and medium, medium businesses can take the, the learning in terms of cybersecurity, they can build their cybersecurity tools based on global platforms. Uh, they can reach out with those solutions not only to public sector entities uh, and customers in, uh, in the region but also globally. Uh, so th there is plenty of opportunity to really uh, sort of become a part of the solution and thinking process how to, how to build those uh, uh, local economies within the free seas group um, also from the cyber security perspective. So I think definitely there is a role uh, for uh, for ICT sector, be it small, local guys, uh, be it also global players. Terrific, thank you very much. Um, so we're winding up with just a final question and then we're going to um, um, invite the previous um, panelists onto uh, the stage um, and uh, We'll also be opening this up to uh, questions from the audience. So, uh, if you have a, like have a question that you would like to ask us, um, please get that ready. Um, we'll also have a chance um, for the uh, our two journalists on the stage here to uh, ask a few questions of, uh, of, of the panelists. So, the um, my final question really is just maybe briefly: Could each of you just explain just briefly what you think is the most important thing to developing um, cyber security capabilities for the um, uh, the 3Cs uh, initiative. And I'm supposed to start with uh, Caroline. Mm, coming back to what Piotr was uh, talking about, the businesses. Uh, according to a research I read recently, 65% of uh, Polish companies uh, were challenged by cyber attacks, while a third uh, were conducted by current employees, and it's not a willful attack, it's usually by negligence and just lack of awareness. I think it's a really important uh, issue because uh, bigger corporations, the ones that are globally present but locally relevant, they invest in cybersecurity and training as well. But the smaller ones are unaware themselves. So I think to build this resilient, social resilience, social knowledge, this again, um, uh, to making um, exchange uh, of, I don't know, of uh, experts, of employees, and training, 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 and awareness building everywhere, not only in companies, but also in ministries. 
but also uh, in editorial boards, but also in schools. I think it's uh, a good start uh, for making our democracy really democratic and not, I don't know, cybercratic and to prepare us uh, to the next years, uh, starting with European Parliament elections. Terrific, I love that word, cybercratic. I think I'm going to borrow that. <laughs> uh, no, um, I'll, I'll, I'll skip the most important thing, because I think I would agree that, that, that we then go into skills and, and, and resilience of, uh, of societies. Uh, what I'll say is that the most interesting thing to me um, is uh, the, the element of the supply chain security question that's been sort of on the minds uh, in the past weeks, uh, months, uh, and then uh, last week the Bloomberg uh, Business Week report uh, that seems to have sort of thrown a bomb into that discussion. Um, I think that, that element is, is for journalists uh, a very interesting one to see because it, it, it sort of shows on one hand how complex this question is of security and infrastructure, um, it's, it's a very complex uh, supply chain when it comes to technology. There's, there's bits and pieces all over the world, and a lot of it is not being done in Europe, uh, both on the coding uh, as on the hardware side. Um, and then secondly, the choices that we make are extremely political and extremely uh, strategic. I think that, is, that makes it one of the most interesting uh, points of the security discussion right now to me. Terrific, thank you very much. Uh, with, uh, with um, this is um, dig digital three Cs, we can we have a chance to uh, take proper care about security of infrastructure from the very beginning to build uh, fiber optic in a way that will reduce at least if not eliminate uh, the risk for for a hardware um, challenge. Five um, G technology. But I very much believe it will also help us to uh, to reduce um, activity and intensity of, of software attack, and it will increase mobility of uh, our uh, of our counter uh, action or counter attack. Today, in many respects, we are limited by the lack of a secure channel of communication. Some countries, some entities also, this is also about commun communicating between uh, government and private um, sectors. Uh, some uh, some um, country or company does uh, notice uh, a malign, malign behavior, but the speed of information about it, and which then could uh, produce reaction, is limited by, by technology uh, or infrastructure. So, so these are, I would say, those two things would, would be uh, now have opportunity. We have opportunity to somehow catch up with, with those two differences. Thank you. Briefly, uh, yeah, I fully subscribe to the skills element in, in the area of cybersecurity, for sure, very much possible. And one more element which might be, which we didn't talk about, but I think would require also uh, an attention in, from the, in the context of cybersecurity. I think, uh, especially within three cities, a uh, group of countries, uh, a proper attention should be put uh, against uh, uh, defending, from the cybersecurity perspective, uh, uh, the basic democratic institutions. Uh, this is connected with. Uh, with fake news, this is connected with uh, with propaganda. This is connected connected with trolling, but also uh, connected with direct attacks on the, the fundamental, let's say, uh, democratic institutions, uh, elections, parliaments, uh, governments. So I think, from that perspective, this group of countries could really uh, uh, put a lot of attention into how to increase the resiliency of, of, of those elements. That's terrific. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to uh, go into the uh, uh, Q&A in a moment. Um, I believe the Minister, did you have a previous engagement? I wasn't sure if you were staying for the Q&A or not. If you, you're welcome to stay, but I wasn't sure, but I thought you had to. Yeah? <laughs>
Well, we'll, we'll have a little, we will perhaps have, we'll have some questions here. We? we have three journalists on the, on, the, on, the, on the stage. I'm sure there won't be any shortage of questions. Um, can I invite the previous panellists to, um, to come up on the stage, please? Thank you. Actually, I have a question. As uh, the editor of the report we're preparing, and I will probably address this question to Piotr Marczuk, who mentioned this, um, this will of global enterprises to act locally, as well as to European journalists. I mean, European in the sense that Lawrence is based in Brussels, Karolina is from Euroactive, but probably also from the authors of the report. Because I would like to mention um, an assessment of one of the authors, uh, who is not here actually. Uh, he wrote that uh, uh, small enterprises act as engines of European economy, uh, but they are not sufficiently financially supported. And um, the EU is largely supporting big companies. And in this way, the development of entrepreneurship in the EU is blocked. Uh, do you have any specific opinion about this? Because I would like to compare your opinions. I think it would so be quite yeah. interesting. Was that directed at a particular person or the entire I think it was directed. Uh, first okay. of all, I would like to uh, ask Peter Magic about this. And uh, if any one of you has an opinion about this, I. I, I actually, I'm. I'm a little bit confused, I must say. I, I don't know what, what was the sort of data for this statement that um, global ones are <coughs> supported in a more um, sort of visible way than, than uh, local SMEs. I, I don't see it. But uh, as I said, I, I, I don't know what, what was the uh, data set as a, as a basis for this statement. Uh, actually, to, to the contrary, we, we have some signals uh, that uh, the, the new program which will be replacing Horizon 2020. Uh, th th there are some ideas that are coming from the European Parliament that uh, actually uh, the, the biggest international companies uh, should be somehow cut off from the from the uh, budget that, that is proposed uh, for the next program, which is actually our worry because uh, quite a number of those big international companies do have uh, R&D centers uh, in Europe, across Europe, and also in, uh, in uh, CE. And those R&Ds are really uh, the, the catalyst centers uh, for local economies, uh, for local startup communities, um, and for local SMEs. So from that perspective, I think there should be, there should be a balance, and there should be an, an open market uh, for reaching out to EU funds, both by big players and by small players. Thank you. Would, would anybody like to um, address that question from perhaps from our panelists uh, from the previous um, panel about the, the disparity or the perceived disparity uh, between the support that large businesses and small businesses, if I understand the question correctly, uh, receive from, from the EU? I mean, do you see this as a, an issue in your countries for um, support for small to medium sized businesses um, in terms of dealing with uh, cyber? Um, uh, very quickly, uh, I think on the contrary, the European Commission as well as members, most uh, member states in the EU are doing a lot to support um, SMEs. I think that, that we need to do more. Um, so, for example, if we talk about the GDPR, I know for a fact that there were you know, a lot of um, SMEs that perhaps didn't even know what the right route to take was two days before it was supposed to be enforced. Um, because the regulation itself, I think, can only be very complicated. Um, and if, as a small uh, and medium enterprise, we don't always have the resources to employ data protection officers or anyone who's going to understand that kind of regulation. Um, so definitely we need to do more. I mean, in, in Slovakia, however, I do see that there's uh, a lot of emphasis even our um, smart industry initiative, for example, um, which I think was, um, was it, it's two, two years old, um, there's a massive focus on, on um, SME. So definitely don't agree that there's a bias or anything towards major players. But of course, I would again reiterate that we need to do more. The European Commission as well as the individual member states. 
especially in as we understand regulation, um, uh, and uh, making sure that they have enough of a voice as well in these sort of issues. I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in Hungary with the big players, big companies, because there is a strategic uh, thinking and communications towards the big companies. That it's one thing that uh, they are there and they are employing uh, Hungarians, but on the other hand, uh, they are encouraged to um, put uh, uh, more funding into research. So, for example, uh, just recently, uh, the company Continental just opened an artificial intelligence center, the first one in the region, in Hungary. So, for us uh, big players, it's not only that uh, they have the knowledge, but they are also willing to share it with us and educate our youth. And I think this is very, very important, because SMEs then, they can also connect to these centers, and then together, they really can uh, have a, a digital ecosystem which is working and, and empowering more and more people. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Um, I think for our two, uh, my two fellow journalists on the, uh, the panel, You've got a, an excellent opportunity here to ask some, uh, uh, some, some insightful questions about uh, the, the Digital 3Cs um, initiative, and I'm just going to invite you to uh, put your questions uh, to the panelists. I might have one, perhaps for the Minister, and then uh, I'll extend it to, to the rest of the panel. Uh, but on the, trans on the transatlantic element um, of, of, of the initiative, um, I think there seems to be a, a an interest in getting more U.S. investment in, in, in the region, and I think having U.S. investment contribute to the broader goals of, 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 of what the digital physics mission is trying to do. So my question is, um, um, to what extent <coughs> have you sort of noticed the interest? To what extent do you think there's, there's potential for a strong relationship between U.S. investors and uh, Eastern Europe? Um, and how do, you, how, how do you see this sort of going forward? And if anyone has any experience in uh, that conversation, there. Well, uh, unlimited uh, potential. Um, let me draw your attention uh, to the fact that Secretary Perry represented US in Ukraine uh, last month and he launched a um, um, initiative partnership on energy cooperation. US can, can be source, uh, can be instrument to diversify. Uh, sources of energy to, to the region, which is very much um, uh, under risk of, of uh, monopoly from one source, uh, if uh, Nord Stream 2, 3 and 4 are uh, developed. Uh, uh, energy is one, uh, one issue, but, uh, but also the, um, cyber security related, uh, related uh, technologies. Uh, defense-related technologies. Poland is um, advancing um, uh, in uh, negotiations on enhanced uh, military presence uh, of the U.S. in Poland. We already have, thanks to the Newport, NATO Newport Summit, uh, Warsaw Summit, and recent July Brussels Summit, we have enhanced forward presence and tailored forward presence from Estonia to, to uh, Romania, Bulgaria. We have um, NATO troops in, in most of the thesis initiative uh, countries. The, it has, or it will have impact on uh, SMEs, on suppliers uh, of different uh, materials. The, the, the challenge of enhanced military, US military presence in, in Poland is mainly an infrastructural challenge, which mean, which gives uh, which gives uh, uh, chance for construction companies, uh, digital companies, all sorts of companies to join and to um, today one a small lab for 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 this is uh, Regikovo missile defense base. That there is a number of subcontractors there, which, which is a challenge in itself, but. Uh, this is new. Uh, uh, those uh, those projects, military projects, are very uh, uh, demanding. Uh, you know, uh, from the perspective of uh, public uh, service, uh, technology.
psychologically uh, in, in all kinds of uh, aspects. Um, so this is uh, this is some of the examples of, of how and, and why US is important to to three C's initiative. They com they com it's important that. Uh, U.S. companies expect U.S. government to uh, be engaged in the initiative. The companies see that uh, the U.S. companies see that today the most dynamic uh, economies in uh, in uh, EU are three uh, initiative countries. Poland alone, within the last two and a half uh, years, grew its economy by 10 percent. Uh, we we are we are now witnessing. Deficit of, of labor. Not uh, we, we have record low number of unemployment, and um, this is a challenge. Like uh, electricity, for example, um, distribution in Warsaw capital, it, it, it becomes difficult to, to set up a, a company because you need to find uh, electricity or, or otherwise office space. Excellent. Thank you, Minister. Um, Piotr, did you want to? Contribute to that, or um, any of the other panelists? Do you have any experience in, in that that you wanted to contribute? If not, with, okay. From my side, just a quick comment that obviously, as an um, employee of an American company, uh, the interest of, of, of U.S. government in in the FRISIS initiative and the support that U.S. government can bring is definitely directly kind of affecting us as the representatives of. of, of uh, of U.S. economy uh, in Europe. So from that perspective, the more coherence and the more leverage we can get, the better. Uh, but all those cybersecurity elements that, that Mr. Minister mentioned, uh, th this is definitely helping because at the same time, we uh, we, we draw our solutions uh, partly in Europe, partly in the United States, uh, and we can support with those solutions uh, governments and societies here in, in this region. Thank you. Um, we have time for one final question from Kevin. We, we, <laughs> we um, uh, the um, apologies to the to the people on the stage, uh, people in the audience can't see the timer on the screen, but uh, that's not correct. We need to be wrapping up in the next uh, sort of next couple of minutes. Um, so, uh, did you have a did you have a question that you wanted to put? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So I have a question about uh, Chinese elbowing uh, its way uh, its way in the region, but also in the world. How is it uh, perceived in your countries? Is it like unconditional welcome, or is it more distanced uh, uh, perspective, like uh, that of anxiety that maybe it's not the right way? I know investment with no. Uh, strings attached might be um, good for the business, but for the cooperation within the EU under its framework, maybe it's not so good. Perhaps is there a comment from uh, uh, from Romania on the end there? You look like you wanted to say something. So thank you for, for the question. I'll try a short answer. Definitely, there is um, uh, no short answer. The situation is quite complex, uh, and that's why I have mentioned the geopolitics of cybersecurity in the context of uh, the discussions we had today. So, um, we are, in, in terms of what I have said, we are really concerned about uh, where do we, as I said, where do we buy the technology from. So, it is very important in. Um, in, in Romania, there is a sort of uh, uh, national scandal regarding uh, a company from uh, from Russia that uh, uh, sold on the Romanian market uh, AV software, antivirus software, and uh, it was a really turmoil. So we are concerned about uh, everything that comes from the east and not only. And we are concerned on uh, we have deep concerns. On what comes from, from Asia and uh, from, from Russia. So, indeed, there is, there is a sort of... Uh, 
I know that, for example, in Hungary, China has its own think tank on foreign relations. Um, they are trying to open an office in Hungary as well as in Brussels. Uh, just recently, there was the conference, uh, the 16, 16 plus one. Um, the Hungarian government supports um, uh, the, the Chinese initiative. Um, you have read many, many articles about it. I don't need to uh, repeat all those. Um, what uh, I would like to actually mention here is that it's very interesting that um, I don't really consider China uh, in the cybersecurity market so, so much as an opponent of the European Union. Uh, however, I see more problem with the um, with the intellectual properties. So I think uh, when we are looking at China's role, um, how the, international, uh, the intellectual properties of uh, Europe and the United States are uh, basically abused, then we really have a problem there. And the second point is, uh, I just recently saw a very interesting um, statistics, how the cybersecurity market is growing intensely. However, um, the European Union is uh, the, the, um, the slice of the cake of the European Union is actually shrinking and Asia is taking over. So we are in actually in quite a high competition here between Asia and Europe. Uh, of course, uh, Latin America and the, the Middle East is also coming up, but they are of course a little bit, uh, bit slower uh, market demand. But here I see that uh, if Europe is not going to get stronger, we are going to lag behind. And China is not only now taking over the markets of putting things together, uh, but also the services. So, so the service market is getting very strong in China. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have time for maybe one last comment on that if uh, anybody wants to, uh, to jump in. Or, um... Okay, thank you very much. But, um, I'd just like to say thank you. Uh, we are we are out of time. The uh, like I said, the, the, the time on the screen there is is, is wrong. Um, just like to say thank you very much uh, to our panelists. Um, perhaps those of you in the audience could just join me in saying uh, thank you uh, for those wonderful contributions from that.